Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to spend some of your time with you here today. It's a real privilege for me. A lot of special people here. So uh, among friends, it's always wonderful to be. So what I'd like to do with all of you this afternoon is I'd like to share with you what I consider to be the absolute four essential principles or conditions for success in the used car business. And I'm going to tell you something about these four conditions that may be interesting and perhaps a bit unfortunate. And that is that unless you have these four conditions in place at all times in your used vehicle operation, I don't believe that you have any reasonable basis to expect to have sustained financial success. Without these four conditions, I don't believe there's any reasonable basis to believe that you will have sustained financial success. But what's unfortunate is that even if you do have them in place at all times, alone they guarantee you of no particular outcome, no particular favorable outcome because there's still a million things that you have to do right every day in that used vehicle operation in order to have a proper outcome. So with them, you have a chance of success. Without them, it's unreasonable to expect success. So let me begin by introducing the first of these four principles. It is your responsibility at all times as operators of used vehicle departments to maintain a used vehicle inventory that has a proper market day supply. Now the definition of market day supply is simply the current available supply of a given vehicle in a market divided by its average daily retail sales rate over the past 45 days. So let's assume that a particular vehicle is under consideration and there are 10 of them in the market just like this one that we're thinking about. And over the past 45 days they've been selling at the rate of one a day retail. You divide the 10 by the one and you get what we call a 10 day market day supply. Now, market day supply is not to be confused with dealership day supply. This is the day supply of that vehicle in the market. Another way of thinking about that is that if no new ones came to the market like this one, but they only continue to sell at the current pace, in 10 days, there'd be no more like it in the market. Now, as used vehicle operators, every day, you have to answer many questions, but three of the most critical questions that you have to answer are as follows. Number one, what cars am I going to put out there for sale? Number two, how much am I willing to pay for them? And number three, how will I price them? And if somebody said to me, Dale, you have to make those three critical decisions with just one piece of information and one piece only, for me, let me tell you what it would not be. It would not be the vehicle's brand. It would not be my dealership's past sales history with that type of a car. It wouldn't even be the condition of the car. If I could know just one thing about a car, I would say, tell me it's market day supply. Market day supply for me would be the single most important piece of information I could possibly possess to answer those three critical questions of what car is what money, what price. Now I would venture to say that for many of you, the knowledge of a vehicle's market day supply doesn't even come into your thought process when you make those critical decisions of what cars, what money, what price. So perhaps what is it that I know that you don't know, or maybe you know something that I don't know, and I'm certainly perfectly willing to learn. But let me explain what I know and see if this makes some sense. I know that there's been a fundamental transformation in the used car market over the past decade but primarily over the past three to five years. As a result of the internet, the transformation that has occurred is one that an economist would characterize as a transformation from an inefficient to an efficient market. Sometimes efficient markets are also referred to as rational markets. Efficient markets, rational markets, the same thing. So what's the definition of an efficient or a rational market? It's simply any market where buyers and sellers know the same things. When buyers and sellers have the knowledge, the same knowledge about their choices and alternatives, we have what is classically characterized as an efficient market. Now, before the internet, was this used car market an efficient rational market? And the answer is absolutely not. In fact, it was wonderfully inefficient in our favor. 
Before the internet, when they came to our used car lot, we knew way better than they knew what these vehicles were worth. We knew way better than they knew how many of them might have been around town if they'd only bothered to go look for them. The deck of knowledge was heavily stacked in our favor. But what's occurred over the past decade and primarily over the past three to five years is that these people come to us today and they know as well, sometimes they even know better than we know. Now, that's what we have on our hands today. We have an efficient market where information about these vehicles, their values, their availability is properly balanced. So what does that mean? Well, what I know is that any time a market is efficient or rational, your destiny as a buyer or a seller, whether you recognize it or not, is largely predetermined. It's predetermined by the time-tested principles of supply and demand. Supply and demand are governing factors that determine the destiny of buyers and sellers alike in any market that's efficient. Now here's what's really interesting to me, is that all of you, and I mean all of you, are experts in understanding principles of supply and demand. You all are experts in managing in an efficient market within your dealership. You know how to make decisions mindful of supply and demand. But unfortunately for many of you, even still today, that knowledge that you possess is not present in your used vehicle management process. Where you guys are all experts in making decisions mindful of supply and demand is in your new vehicle department. And why would that be? Well, you see, your new vehicle department has been an efficient market for decades. For decades, when people have walked into our showroom asking for models we don't have or prices we're not willing to offer, they've known exactly where to go for identical choices and alternatives. They've known pretty darn well what they should pay based on what we should pay, what we paid. So consequently, we all grew up in a new vehicle marketplace fully understanding and appreciating these principles of supply and demand. But you see, in our used car market, this efficiency has only really occurred in the past three to five years. And you see that when the market was inefficient, these principles of supply and demand really didn't matter as much as they do now that the market has become and continues to become ever more efficient. The more efficient a market becomes, the more relevant are these principles of supply and demand. So in your new car showroom, you know fully properly how to operate mindful of these principles of supply and demand. And let me prove that to you. When your manufacturer rep calls you up and the first words out of their mouth are, I need you to do me a favor, yeah. <laughs> you know exactly what's coming. And without any help from me or anybody else, you know exactly how to respond to it. Oh, no, no, don't need those cars. No, no, and why? Because every single bit of experience you've ever had has taught you the penalty that gets put upon you when you find yourself as a seller in the efficient new car market in possession of vehicles of high supply and low demand. You know how awful it is. And then when you do take them, and sometimes you have to, never in a million years would you reach into your wallet and pull out your hard-earned after-tax dollars and hand it over to lovely nice people at autotrader.com and say, here, please take my money and advertise these high market day new cars of mine to my market for over the money. Never in a million years would you ever dream of doing such a thing in your new car operation, but you want to know something? That's exactly what many of you are doing today in your used vehicle operation. And I could prove it. So why would you do such a thing? Why would you do something in your used car operation that you'd never dream of doing in your new car operation? Well, my belief is that it's simply because, it's only because of late that this used car market has become efficient. And it's not that we don't feel the pain of that efficiency, those customers knowing what we know. We certainly feel that pain, but what we really don't understand quite as well is or are the consequences to our past management practices of now doing business in the efficient, rational used car market. What we have to understand today is that those same principles of supply and demand that we all know so well in our new car showroom are playing out, are playing out and determining our destiny in the used vehicle operation. So what does it mean to have vehicles 
of high demand and short supply, or put another way, low market day supply. What are the benefits? Well, there are many, but there are two very important ones. And once again, these are ones that all of you know very well in the context of your new vehicle showroom experience. Tell me if this isn't true. Is it not true that the day that the transport arrives at the dealership carrying those very special cars, you know which ones I'm talking about, those ones that are on that truck out front right now might be the first ones like them to hit the market, and we've had people waiting for them. High demand, short supply, or put another way, low market day supply. Is it not true that the very day those transports arrive and deliver those cars, people show up and sometimes take delivery of those cars that we've never seen or heard from before? It's as if they followed the transport. It's like they came out of the woodwork. It almost seems magical, but in fact, it's not magical at all. It's natural. It's one of the first natural benefits of being a seller of any item in any efficient market when it possesses that special quality of low market day supply. Instead of you working hard and spending a lot of money trying to find them, they're out there right now in their homes and offices using their time and maybe even their employer's time trying to find you. So the cost of acquiring the sale goes down as the market day supply of your inventory goes down. The cost of acquiring the sale is the first critical benefit of being a seller in possession of vehicles with low market day supply, whether they be new or used. And the second benefit you also understand really well, and that is that that item, that car, becomes less subject to price competition. And tell me if this isn't true. When that shopper comes in on that new hot car, you know, high demand, short supply, low market day supply, and they say, well, what kind of discount do I get? You look them in the eye you know, and almost want to laugh and say, I'm sorry, no discount. And they say, oh, OK, just thought I should have asked. Yeah, should have asked, but it didn't work. Well, when is the only time? When is the only time you ever get away with saying to a customer, I'm sorry, there's no discount? The only time that ever works is when you have that special privilege of representing an item of low market day supply. In fact, I would go so far as to say how well you understand this principle, that what determines the blue sky that you'll pay for a new car franchise is not based on its country of origin. It's not based on its fuel efficiency. You'll pay the moon to own franchises that build vehicles of high demand and short supply and you'll run for the hills from ones that build vehicles of high supply and low demand. So you see, you know what I'm telling you is correct. The only thing that possibly you haven't really appreciated well up until now is the fact that those same market day supply, supply and demand principles apply to your used vehicle operation. So you see, every one of you has a used vehicle inventory, and every one of those inventories has an overall market day supply, and whether you recognize it or not, that single number of that market day supply of that inventory tells us whether we have a hot franchise or a cold franchise. It tells us much about how much success we're likely to enjoy in the coming weeks and months. So it is now time that every moment that you have a chance to influence that used vehicle inventory's market day supply, you take advantage of it. And you know, the unfortunate thing is, in your new car business, you really can influence the market day supply of your inventory. Most of those decisions are being made by the manufacturer. But when it comes to used vehicle decision making, you're in possession of all of the information and all of the critical decisions that affect the market day supply. So in other words, when I make that first initial judgment, is that a car that I want to own for stock? Among other things, could I please know its market day supply? I have to put a value on the car? OK, among other things, could I please know its market day supply? Now I own the car, and I have to make that next critical decision. Am I going to retail or am I going to wholesale it? Among other things, I'd like to know its market day supply. I have to put, or I have to make a critical decision on a reconditioning. Do you do it or don't you do it? OK, could you please tell me the market day supply of the car? I have to put a price on the car. Could I please know its market day supply? The short deal is brought to me at the desk, you know, and I have to make that critical decision to take a lousy low gross or the customer is going to walk. Fine. Among other things, could you please tell me the vehicle's market day supply? You see, I'm not saying that it's the only thing that we want or need to know, because it's certainly not. But it's got to be one of, if not the single most important thing 
that we need to know when we make all of those critical used car management decisions. Because as you begin to make decisions with the knowledge of that market day supply, down goes the market day supply of your overall used inventory. And as that number goes down, you are much more likely to be visited by success. When you sit down at those monthly, quarterly, weekly used car management meetings and you talk about what's going right, what's going wrong, I know what you talk about, how many units, how many dollars, the age, great, all that stuff's fine and well and good. But somebody better be asking the question, what's the market day supply of our inventory? What was it last week? What was it last month? Why is it going up? Why is it going down? What do we need to do? It is completely under your control. And if you don't recognize today as used car operators that that market day supply is an absolute integral component for your success, then with all due respect, you really do not understand the used car business. And if you do understand it and you're not willing to take control of it and take responsibility for managing it, then you should never be heard to complain about poor used car results. Does that make sense? The second critical condition that must be in place at all times for a reasonable expectation of success the second critical condition for which you are responsible for as used car operators is to make sure that at all times your used vehicles are properly priced. Now, what does properly priced inventory mean today? Well, what I'm going to say is that the way that most dealers still today, still today, the way most dealers price vehicles is wrong and it's costing them a lot of money to continue to do it that way. So how is it that they're doing it? Well, they're doing it today largely in the same way that it's been done for the past 75 years. And I might add that old way that we've been doing it used to make us a lot of money, made many of us very wealthy. But yet today, I'm here to tell you that it's costing you money. So how, what is that old way? Well, with some variants, perhaps it works generally like this. When the car is fresh to us, we put it out there for some initial period of time, maybe 30 days. And then we put a pretty big markup on it, maybe three to $5,000. And then if the car is still out there after that initial period of time, we drop the price. And if it doesn't sell, we drop it again. And we continue to drop it until either it sells or trips some sort of wholesale wire. With some degree of variance, that's still the way, unfortunately, most dealerships are doing it today. And if that sounds at all like the way that you're doing it, I will tell you that it is absolutely costing you money. So why am I so sure of that? Well, I'm sure of that because I know that the way that people used to shop for a used car and the way they do it today is different. You see, back in my day, when somebody was interested in a used car, they'd get in their automobile, they'd drive down a motor mile, they'd pull in our lot, they'd get out of the car, and they'd walk our inventory. If they happened to land on one of our used cars, you know, life was great. If they didn't land on one of our used cars, they got back in their automobile, they drove to somebody else's lot, and they walked their inventory and so on until they found a car. And I'm sure there's still some people who are willing to do it that way, but I'm also sure that there's fewer people every day. Now, the way that people are doing it today, and I suspect you are fully aware of this, is that before they leave their home, they go to a destination site where they expect there to be a lot of cars, like an auto trader. They're prompted to type in their zip code and the type of car they want. So, okay, they type in their zip code. They, you know, they enter Chevy Tahoe. They hit search, and bam, you know, lots of them. In fact, too many of them. They cannot possibly go out and consider all those vehicles. So you all know what happens next. They reduce it to a short list. Now, listen carefully, please. I am not saying that the only thing they use to reduce it to a short list is price. And I'll repeat that. I am not saying that the only thing they use to reduce it to a short list is price. But I'm pretty sure it's one of the things they use. And in fact, it might be one of the more important things they use. But regardless, they get it down to a short list, maybe four, five, six cars. Then they go out and they visit those cars. Now, I'm not saying that it's necessarily those cars that they end up buying, but I am pretty sure it is from those dealerships from whom they do end up buying a car. And I think that you probably understand that that's pretty much the way it works today, and it's probably the way it works more every single day. And if you do agree with that, I have to ask the question, why in the world would any dealer price their vehicles with an arbitrary markup for an arbitrary period of time if that's the way people shop? There, in fact, is no logical justification for that behavior, and yet it's prevalent. And I refuse to believe that as an industry that we don't get it, we don't understand, or we're not smart, 
but yet we still do it that way, and there's no logical justification for it. I'll tell you what I believe there is. There's rationalization for it, but in my mind, justification is premised in logic, and rationalization is premised in psyche. And I think there probably are two things that perhaps you might be telling yourself as operators that rationalize that behavior, that behavior that cannot be justified with logic. The first thing I'm pretty sure that you're telling yourself is, you know, I'm going to have to sell a lot of cars and take a lot of short deals. So I deserve, I need that chance on every car, give every car that chance to make a hit because Lord knows I'm going to take a lot of short deals. Pretty sure you guys tell yourself. And there's also something else that I know that you guys tell yourself that is really dangerous today, and yet I don't think that you are very willing to acknowledge it. And I'll tell you what I think it is. You know, when you're an automobile dealer, you're omnipresent. I mean, you occupy some of the most trafficked real estate in your communities. You have some of the most amazing facilities imaginable. Your name is in the airwaves, you know, radio and TV. Your name is on billboards. Your name has been in your communities for generations. You are wonderful people, wonderful people in terms of giving back to your communities. You guys are involved in your civic and charitable and religious and educational institutions. And for all of that giving, for all of that presence that you have in your market, I believe that you're all too willing to overassume, overplay an assumption that all that presence and commitment to your community allows you to expect their shopping loyalty. I'm sure there is still some, but I also know that there's a lot less than there used to be. And I believe that the truth of that statement is probably something that the typical automobile dealer doesn't want to accept as much as it ought to be accepted. And you know, let me maybe make a case for you to help you understand the truth of, of this fact, that there's less shopping, or there's less loyalty to the relationship. You know, most towns across America, right downtown on Main Street, there used to be a family-owned business. Very often, that family-owned business has been there on that Main Street for several generations of family ownership. And that local business would sell appliances, refrigerators, stoves, washers, and dryers. Many of you remember those, but few of us today could find one. Now, those businesses were right downtown Main Street. Those people and their kids went to school with our parents and our grandparents. They were involved in the same religious and educational and civic institutions that we are. But yet, they're gone. Hard to find one of those today. What in the world happened to those local family businesses? Well, we know exactly what happened. The big box retailer came to town and simply did one thing, just simply offered the promise of lower prices. That's all they did. That's all they had to do is simply say, we sell for less, and those people who we grew up with close their doors forever. Let me make it maybe even a little bit more personal. Every one of us have bought an appliance of some sort in the last year or two. And I bet you few of us, very few of us, perhaps none of us, even tried, even thought to try, to find one of those local business people to give them an opportunity for your business. I'm pretty sure that's true. You did exactly what everybody does. You just default to the assumption that it's better for you to go to that big box retailer. Now, listen, if there's anybody in the entire world that should have crossed rivers and climbed mountains to give that local business person a chance at your patronage, it would have been you, because that's who you are. You are the people that expect the shoppers in your community to do that for you, and you won't even do it. Huh, think about that. If you won't do it, why in the world should we ever believe that anybody would? Even though this isn't 100% true, I know, I believe that you'd all be more successful if you operated with the assumption that nobody will visit your establishment unless 
you give them a compelling reason to do so. I know you'd all be more successful if you operated with that premise. So the reason that many of us still today price vehicles in that irrational way is because we assume things that we ought not to assume to the extent we assume them. We, we tell ourselves things that don't justify logic, and we continue to do it. So what if I'm right? <laughs> or what if there's even just some truth to what I'm saying? What does that mean that you should do when it comes to pricing vehicles? Am I possibly coming to you today and saying you can't price them all high and give yourself that chance you need and deserve? Am I possibly saying that today you got to price them all low out of the gate just to appeal to these non-loyal internet shoppers? No, that's not what I'm saying. Today, properly pricing cars is not about pricing them all high, nor is it pricing them all low. The key today is to know, to know which cars can and should be priced high. And if you drop them, you drop them very gradually. And which cars on day one should be priced low and be prepared to drop them quickly? The key today is to know. OK, how do you know? Well, I'll offer you a very simple two-step strategy. That if you just followed this simple two-step strategy, you would get this initial pricing decision right the vast majority of the time. And the first of these two steps, you really don't need much help, if any, from me, because this one you all already have pretty well down pat. You see, you have this innate or trained ability where you can walk around a car, look at it in all four sides, and pretty quickly say, wow, that is a car. And then you'll walk around the next one, you'll look at it the same way, and you'll say, eh, just a car, nothing special. And do not ever underestimate the value of your ability to do that. Because thankfully, no matter what the internet is, it will never take away the emotional component for a purchaser of a used vehicle. And your ability to look at that vehicle as merchandise and assess its potential appeal to a prospective shopper is key. It's the first critical step in knowing whether it's one of these that you price here or one of those that you better be pricing low. But unfortunately, that's where we tend to want to stop. You see, today, we have to take a second look at this car. This time, not as merchandise for its emotional appeal, but this time as an investment. And ask ourselves, how likely is this one to achieve my investment objectives? And what are those investment objectives? Simple, fast turn and high gross. It's all you're really ultimately worried about, how fast and how much. Now, here's a hint, OK? Here's the hint. In a rational, efficient market, that's the hint, what is the best way to predict how fast and how much? Come on. Thank you, market day supply. Ding, ding, ding. So in other words, you walk around a car with your car eyes, and you say, wow, that's a car. And if that particular car happens to have low market day supply, that's a car you can be pretty well assured can and should be priced high. And if you drop it, you drop it slowly. But on the other hand, you walk around the next car, and you look at it, and you say, yeah, it's just a car. And that particular one happens to have high market day supply. There is absolutely no logical justification to price that car high for any period of time, unless you want to play for luck. And yeah, you get lucky still once in a while now and then, but less all the time. And I wouldn't advise any of us running our businesses assuming that we're going to get lucky. So if I could give you this analogy, Maybe it's like getting up to the baseball plate, the batter's plate, in a baseball game. And no matter what the first pitch is, by God, we want to swing for the fence. Well, if that first pitch is a softball lob right over the center of the plate, it makes all the sense in the world to swing for the fence. But we don't get so many of those pitches anymore. We get a lot of soft or curveballs and sinkers and sliders. But by God, it hasn't affected our swing. We still want to swing for the fence because it's the first pitch. And today, we have to be better than that. Today, we have to have an understanding of today's marketplace that says that we have to take two looks at every one of these incoming opportunities. Once as merchandise based on its emotional appeal to a prospective customer, and a second time as an investment and ask ourselves, how likely is it to achieve our objectives of fast turn and high gross most properly, not perfectly, but most predictably measured by its market day supply? And be prepared to adjust your swing accordingly. Have the maturity of understanding of this marketplace to realize that it's really not about how many home runs we hit. It's about how many runs we score. 
And I can assure you that if you took my advice on this, you'll miss some home runs that you otherwise would have gotten. I can promise you that would happen. But guess what? You'll be better off for it. You'll be more successful for it. Because while you want to hang out there and hold out on a home run for every car for some given period of time, you're missing the critical opportunities that you need to be scoring runs. So you see, I might make a bargain with you. I might, for the sake of argument purposes, concede to you that, OK, maybe every car does deserve a chance, so long as you could concede to me that it doesn't have to mean that every car deserves the same chance. Some cars deserve more and longer of a chance than other cars do. And when it comes to initially pricing cars right, it's about our ability to discern one from the other based on rational market-based principles. OK, we have the car priced right. That was easy. Now. How in the world am I supposed to know when to reprice that car, how often to reprice that car, and how much to reprice that car? Well, I'm going to tell you something. In all of my professional life, I've never been able to make a recommendation of a strategy with greater confidence than the one that I'm going to give you here today. Normally, there just aren't too many things that you could say if you just do it. It will work. And this comes about as close as anything that I've ever come to know. And I'd like to introduce the strategy by presenting an analogy. I've come to really understand and appreciate that there are a lot of similarities between the principles of being a good parent and being a good used vehicle inventory and pricing manager. So what is it that we might all agree on about being a good parent? And even if we're not parents, we're all kids. So hopefully, we can all relate to this. Well, the first thing that we need to know about being a good parent is that every one of our kids is different. They're each individual. They each have their own strength and weakness. They each need different things at different times in different ways. Consequently, any notion that being a good parent means that we do the same thing for all of our kids at the same time in the same way it just can't be right. They all need different things, different times, different ways. And we, we have to know that. The next thing that we know about being a good parent is just how critical it is to be there. Be there for quality time. And quality time can take any form. But traditional form of quality time is like meals together, getting them out of bed in the morning, putting them to bed at night. I mean, these tend to be those special moments when we can look into their eyes and maybe even their souls and ask ourselves, what's going on with this one? Well, the challenge with kids is that they often don't have the ability to explain what's going on. Sometimes they don't even have the ability to talk to you at all. That's what makes it really challenging. As a parent, you got to sort of piece it together, you know, connect the dots, hopefully get it right. And if you do get it right, hopefully have the means to provide that which they need. These are really big, tough challenges, and we know these. So how does that relate, maybe, to being a good inventory or pricing manager? Well, let's, let's take that analogy to work. The first thing I would ask you to recognize is that every one of those used vehicles on your lot is individualistic. Everyone has its own unique strengths and weaknesses. Each one needs something different at a different time in a different way. You can be sure of it. Consequently, any notion that good used car management means we do certain things to all cars at a certain time in a certain way just can't be right cannot be as good as we need to be. We have to appreciate the fact that they're all different, and they all need different things, different times, different ways. The second step of this analogy, just like being a parent, is that it's really important to spend as much quality time with each one as you can. And it doesn't have to be a lot. It just needs to be often, and it needs to be quality time. And I can assure you, the more time that you'd be willing to spend a little bit of quality time with each individual car as often as you can, the more successful you'll be. But here's where this analogy begins to differ in a really interesting way. Unlike our kids, our cars speak to us. Yes, they speak to us. 
But unlike our kids, they speak to us with amazing, and I mean crazy amazing, directness and clarity. We would only wish that our kids would speak to us as directly as our vehicles do in terms of what's going on with them, what it is that they need. So how is it that cars talk? Because they really don't talk. Well, I ask you to think about sites like Autotrader, maybe cars.com, as being like big voting machines, big voting machines in the sky. Each one of these sites has a couple million cars on them. And every day, all day long, people are voting on these cars with their mouse. They're clicking on these cars every day, all day long with their mouse. And guess what? Today, we can get the tabulated results of those votes. And I'm going to tell you something about those tabulated vote tallies. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, that I have ever found in this business that speaks as truthfully, as unbiasedly, as directly to how that vehicle is performing from a competitive standpoint. It's absolutely the purest, most gospel data that you could possibly receive. And the form of those tabulated results that I'm referring to are two, SRPs and VDPs. I'm hoping by now you guys understand what those mean. Well, let me give you an example of two vehicles. And these are not hypothetical. These exist in every one of your inventories today. And you could find them if you went and looked after only about 10 days online. After only about 10 days online, they've gotten enough vote tallies, or no vote tallies, to speak to you in this amazing gospel truthful language. So let me give you two examples. And both of these cars exist in multiples in your inventory today. The question is whether you know it or not. The first of these cars might be one that's characterized by having, in the last 10 days of inventory, or the first 10 days of inventory life online, 1,000 SRP appearances. They've appeared 1,000 times on an SRP. But it's gotten zero BDPs. Okay, That's car number one. Car number two has gotten 65 VDP view, or excuse me, SRP views in the same period of time, and it's got five VDP views, okay? If these were your two kids, let me tell you about your children. This first car could be your daughter. And your daughter is a high schooler, and she comes home from school, and she's reporting that she is pretty popular. She's little Miss Popular. She's got all the attention of all the guys. But guess what? Prom was a, or homecoming was a couple weeks ago. She didn't have a date. And you know what? Uh, today's Thursday. She doesn't have a date for tomorrow or for Saturday, for that matter. Now, if that was your child, and those were the conditions, those were the circumstances, would you be a good parent if you didn't maybe think that, hmm, maybe something's going on there? Would you be a good parent if you knew it or observed that sort of issue and didn't do anything about it? No, of course you wouldn't. She needs something. I, you know, who knows what it is? It could be a new haircut. It could be a new outfit. It could be anything, OK? But you know as a parent, I know some of you wouldn't want her to have that. I, I get it. I know that. But I mean, you get my point, right? If that was your kid and you didn't recognize her, you didn't try and solve for it, you really wouldn't be a good parent. Well, that's your first car. And it exists in multiples in your inventory right now. You've got cars right now in your inventory that if you just spent a few moments of quality time and listened to them speak to you through this gospel language of SRP and VDP, you would understand that you've got Little Miss Popular. It's showing up like crazy in SRP searches. It is popular, but yet nobody's asking yours out. Now, if you don't know that, are you a good used vehicle inventory manager? If you did know it and you failed to act upon it, would you be a good inventory manager? No. And I am not suggesting that the only issue here could be price, because after all, we are talking about a pricing strategy here. There are certainly other factors that you are well aware of, merchandising factors. But if you've got all those merchandising factors right, it does come down to price. And guess what? It's manageable. But if it's left unattended, you could be pretty well assured, unless you get lucky, that that car is going to go the distance of age. You're not a good inventory manager if you don't recognize and appropriately respond to that. Let me tell you about the second car in your inventory. This one I know really well. This one is my oldest son. His name is Austin. Let me tell you about this guy Austin of mine. 
all the way through high school, most every weekend, he was home. He didn't hang out, didn't go to the football games. He was a loner, <clears throat> incredibly shy. I know it's hard to believe he was my kid. <laughs> but that's true. Now, did I recognize that? Yeah, you bet I recognized it. Did it concern me? Oh, yeah. Did I take you know, a lot of actions, try a lot of different things to help get him out there, help loosen him up a little bit, you know, get him a little bit more comfortable? Yeah, of course I did. It's what you would do, too. OK, well, that's your second car. You understand that? You've got a car that is socially shy, intimidated, not getting a lot of attention. But guess what? Just like my son Austin, the few times that kids did break through that barrier, they loved him. They loved him. They understood that he was really a special guy in a lot of special ways. And all they wanted to do was hang out with him. Well, your car, as little attention as it's getting, when it does get seen online on an SRP page, people are all over it. What does that car need? Certainly not a price change. I wouldn't think, anyhow. But are you not all experts in knowing how to give a vehicle attention that's not a very popular car? Of course you know what to do. What might you do? You might spotlight that car. You might uh, advertise that car in another medium. You might be sure that car is on the front line. You might make sure it's on the point of the front line. You might give your salespeople a spiff after only 10 days of inventory life because you know that car's got a weakness. It's got a weakness that needs to be addressed. But you see, these cars are giving you absolute gospel information about how they're performing on a competitive basis if you just simply understood the language in which they speak and gave them each a little bit of quality attention. And once again, I'll tell you, in all of my professional career, having dispensed this advice to many dealers, many of you in the room. In fact, one of you in the room here today, on break here, just told me, since they've been doing this, how it has been a game changer. This will change the game for you. If you only start to parent your cars, as you know, we should parent our children. It's an absolute game changer. So pricing vehicles right, your second responsibility. And once again, I'm going to say, it's a little bit tough love here, but I'm going to say that if you don't recognize today how people shop and consequently the, the need to price vehicles right, then you just fundamentally don't understand today's used car business. And if you do get it, and I hope you do, but you fail to act on it, you should never be heard to complain about poor results. OK, it's two of the four. Number three, and I have to give you fair warning on this one. This one takes me off the rails, if you don't think I'm already off. <laughs> this third condition for which you are responsible for is your obligation to manage how right you own your cars. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to make two statements upon which my case to you is based. And if I'm wrong on either one of these two statements or beliefs, my logic is flawed. But I don't think I'm wrong. So let, let me give you these two foundational beliefs for the case I'm going to make to you. Today, we have to pay more to acquire a good used vehicle at wholesale than we ever have had to in the past. And I could get into reasons that we really don't have time for here today. But basically, the long and short of it is that we have a tighter used car supply and you have more demand in the wholesale market than we did years ago. And I don't see it fundamentally changing in the foreseeable future. That's my first foundational belief for the point I'm going to make to you. My second foundational belief no one will ever argue with or debate, and that is that every day you go to work, you experience ever greater pricing pressure. And you know that's true. OK, so if I'm right, here is your reality. You are operating with a high wholesale floor and a sinking retail ceiling. High wholesale floor and sinking retail price ceiling. Let me characterize it another way. What you're operating with today is margin compression. And I'm going to tell you a bit more tough news here. I don't anticipate that margin compression to get any better. I anticipate it to get worse. While we might debate what happens to wholesale prices of vehicles over the long term, none of us will debate the issue that we will always experience ever great price and pressure. So here's what I have a real big problem with. <clears throat> I'll tell you that any other business in the entire commercial world 
faced with margin compression would behave radically different than we do as car dealers. Any other business. And let me see if I can make this case to you. Suppose instead of being automobile dealers here today, suppose that you all owned or operated bakeries. And suppose that I'm some sort of industry, bakery industry analyst, <clears throat> and I come to you, and I say, I got some tough news for you guys. You ready? You know, you guys make cakes and cookies and pastries, and you sell them and pay your bills and support your families. Well, your raw material from which you make that stuff, flour and sugar, as of today, is going to become very scarce. And in fact, I'm going to give you a warning. There is going to be some times when you can't even get it. And when you do get it, be prepared. You're going to pay the moon. You got that? Now, if I delivered that news to you as bakery operators and owners, I could predict with 100% certainty certain changes in your behavior. For example, I am sure that from this day forward, you will spend a lot more time back in that storage room measuring, quantifying, assessing how far that present material will take you. You'll calculate and assess what it means to your cost of goods. You'll have a whole new maniacal you know, um, you know, attention to this, to this asset, this precious and now scarce and very expensive resource. If you did not, you'd be an irresponsible business owner. And I'm also similarly confident that there would be a brand new culture of conservation of that precious raw material, flour, and sugar in your kitchen. You would implore upon your employees, oh, you can't waste this stuff. You can't afford to put a speck more in a recipe than it calls for, and by gosh, don't let any of it fall on the floor. This stuff's like gold, and it is. I mean, that would become a culture in your kitchen. And this would be similar for any other business in the entire world except for the car dealer. Let me ask you guys a question as car dealers. Do you not understand that the spread between what you own these cars for and what they're likely to be sold for is your flour and sugar? Do you not understand that your flour and sugar is becoming scarce and it's getting more expensive? Because if you do understand those things, I'm confused. I can't see any change whatsoever in your behavior. I can't even see any concern. Now, I certainly understand that I hear all of you lamenting and complaining about the symptoms of this problem. Oh, gross, gross, or low, gross, can't make money like we used to, can't make profit in the used car department. Everybody wants to complain about the symptoms, but nobody in our industry is talking about the root problem, and the root problem is margin compression. And I'm going to tell you from my perspective, that margin compression represents the single, not the only, but the single greatest threat to your used car viability and perhaps to your entire enterprise viability. That's right, that used car margin compression, because it's only going to get worse. And nobody seems to be bothered by it. You know, let me, let me make that point. If it's at the end of the day and it's time to go home here at the dealership, and we're getting ready to lock up, one of our last official acts of the day is to balance the cash register box. OK? Well, if that box doesn't balance, if it's off by $100, oh, do it again. Do it again. And we're not going home till we figure out why it doesn't balance by $100. And if we can't figure it out tonight, I guarantee you that issue is going to be front and center on the GM or the owner's desk tomorrow morning. Because no way, no how, are we going to allow $100 to go missing and not be all sorts of concerned about it. And you know I'm right. OK. Well, I bet you I could go to work for most any of your stores as your used car manager. And in the first two weeks of my employment, just out of neglect, I could allow 5% of the equity of your used vehicle inventory to evaporate, and you wouldn't even notice it. If you had a million dollar inventory and I did that, I would have taken $50,000 out of your used car cash drawer and you wouldn't even notice it, let alone be bothered by it. And you know I'm right. So what in the world are we thinking? Do you guys know something I don't know? 
How could we be so maniacally concerned about $100 missing unaccounted for it out of our cash drawer, and we wouldn't even notice if $50,000 went missing out of our used car equity drawer? Do we think that we have so much of it, it's so readily available and so inexpensive that it just doesn't need to be managed? And it used to be, I mean, it truly used to be the fact that we could go to that wholesale marketplace, buy all the used cars we want cheap, and even when we had to pay up for some, we'd bring them back to the dealership and just ask more money, and we still got to see customers. Is that what we have today? No, we have anything but that today. But honest to God, for the life of me, I cannot detect any concern on the car dealer's part. You don't even seem to notice it, let alone care, but yet we all complain about the symptoms. How are we missing this? I believe that today this margin compression has got to be recognized for what it is. And listen, recognizing, properly recognizing a problem is the first step of solving a problem. We have to recognize as a management responsibility that it is our obligation every single day to be maniacally concerned about maintaining and conserving the equity in our used vehicle inventory. Now. Some of you might be sitting out there thinking, well, you know, I, I'm concerned about it. I don't know what he's talking about. Well, I could put it to the test. So here is the test. And here's first the rules of the test. The rules of the test are two. You can't guess and you can't look, okay? Can't guess, can't look. So without guessing, without looking, I don't believe, and I'd be surprised if there's anyone, and there might be one or two, but in a room of this size, I bet hardly any. I bet there's hardly anyone in this room as of today that could tell me how much equity you have in your inventory. Mm -hmm. See? And you should not convince yourself that you're doing a darn thing about managing, conserving equity in your inventory, your flour and sugar, unless you are measuring it because you can't manage anything in life or business unless you measure it. And if you don't know the answer to that question, you can't or shouldn't convince me or anyone else yourself, most importantly, that you're managing it because you have to measure it. it we just don't seem to be bothered. We don't seem to recognize that this is the issue. And you know, we have to understand that the spread between what we own these cars for and what they're gonna be sold for, that's our flour and sugar. That represents the totality of the universe of opportunity we have for front-end gross. And if there's not enough there, bad news. There's nothing you can do to be successful. There's no amount of talent. There's no amount of enthusiasm, no amount of effort, no amount of marketing spend that you can put forth to overcome that deficiency. Now, if we ever bothered to measure equity in the past, traditionally, when would we have done it? If we did it at all, well, I can tell you when we would have done it, two times. Tax time, and when we just fired that scoundrel used car manager. All right, we want to know how bad they hurt us. Very few dealerships today will measure it quarterly, monthly, weekly, or daily. And if we ever did bother to measure it, the way we would do it is we would generally calculate the difference between what we're in them for versus their wholesale value. And I have a real problem with that, a pretty serious problem. I believe that that is a terrible form of measurement, and if we don't have a solid form of measurement, we shouldn't expect to be effective managers. And the reason that the old traditional way of managing or measuring, I should say, equity is, is insufficient is that wholesale value is just an opinion, yours versus mine. And we all know we'll all have different opinions of a wholesale value of a car. So for example, if, if we're in a car for 10 and its wholesale value is nine, but you think it's seven and someone else thinks it's you know, six and a half, we can't even agree on the extent to which we have a problem. So we can't even get on the same page out of the gate in terms of solving for that problem if we can't agree. And that's why I don't care for that traditional form of management or measurement of, of equity. What I'm gonna give you today is what I consider to be a much superior one. And that is what we call the cost to market measuring system. Instead of taking what you're in the vehicle for against its wholesale value, I'm gonna ask you to take what you're in the vehicle for against its average retail asking price. Why would I suggest that? Well, either that or wholesale, either one is just a consistent benchmark, but every one of you has a tool today 
that will show you, tell you objectively what the average retail asking price of that car in your market is today. We don't have to agree or disagree or discuss it. It is what it is. It gives it to you. It's objective, and for that reason, it's superior. So in other words, if you own a vehicle for $8,500, and the average retail asking price of that car in this market today is 10 grand. You divide the 8,500 by the 10 grand, you'd get what we call an 85% cost to market. Okay? You got that? Now, your cost to market measured in that form, your cost of a vehicle that goes into that formula has three components, and it's important you understand this. It is comprised of three things. Number one, what you paid to acquire the car. Number two, what you spent to recondition the car. And number three, what, if anything, you packed it. Now, you need to listen to this very carefully. All of you have an inventory. If you bothered to measure your cost to market the way I described, if you took the first of those three elements, excluding your pack, just what you paid to acquire it, what you spent to recondition it, if you did the cost to market measurement on your current inventory using that calculation, and if yours is over 84%, I got bad news for you. You don't stand a chance. You do not stand a chance. If that is over 84%, I can guarantee you one of two things is your reality. Either your used vehicle department is not making money, or if it is making money, somebody's looking at it and saying, you got to be kidding me. This is what I made for all of that investment, risk, effort, exposure? It's clearly insufficient. How do I know that's true? How can I be so confident of that statement? Well, today I've got a really good idea where your, ve your used vehicles transact as a percentage of, of market in the low 90s, high 80s. You know, that place where people are sitting in your dealerships right now saying, okay, I'll take it, is somewhere around 90%. And if you own your vehicles as a cost to market for more than 84%, that gives you less than a 6% spread. And I don't think there's too many dealerships that are so operationally efficient that they can afford to pay a commission, cover all their expenses, and have anything respectable, if anything at all, left over with less than a 6% spread. Now, you want to hear some really tough news? Based on my general experience, based on that formula of, of calculation, somewhere around half of the dealers in the market, perhaps half of you, maybe not you guys, you're enlightened, you're here, but about half the dealers in the market have a cost market over 84%. And I have to tell you, that's really sad. That is really tragic. And I'll tell you why it's so sad and tragic. Because people have gotten up, left their families this morning, gone to work, believing that if they work hard, and I'm sure they are, and smart, and I'm sure they are, that they have a chance at a successful outcome. And you want to know something? They don't. And they don't even know it. Because if you don't have enough front end spread, flour and sugar in your inventory spread between what you own them for and what they're likely to be transacted for, nothing you could do can overcome that problem. Nothing you can do will overcome that problem. So as I said a few moments ago, the first step to solving a problem is recognizing the problem rather than complaining about the symptoms. The, the basic problem and the most critical threat, I believe, to our viability is this margin compression. And if you think about what goes into that, it, it really comes down to how effectively and efficiently we're buying these vehicles and how effectively and efficiently we're reconditioning them. And I have to tell you something, as, as operators of used vehicle departments, if we don't recognize the criticality of this margin compression, then we really do not understand the essence of today's used cars business. And if we do understand it, but we're not willing to commit ourselves to innovate, to iterate ways of measuring and managing effectiveness of purchasing and effectiveness of reconditioning, then we ought not to ever be heard to complain about substandard results. OK, it's the third critical component a used vehicle inventory that possesses the proper cost to market equity. The final one that we're going to talk about today is your responsibility for age management. Now, traditional age management was measured traditionally by the 60-day rule. You know, how many cars do you have over 60 days of age? And I have to tell you, I believe that that no longer is the most important measurement of age discipline. 
It's important, and I'm still concerned about it, but I don't believe it's the most important any longer. And I also want to say this, that if you don't know this, you better know this, that age management discipline always has been and will always continue to be one, if not the single most important principle to achieve used car success. If you're not willing to manage age, it's not going to happen. Not in today's environment. So if me measuring based on the 60-day rule isn't right, what is right? Well, let me take a step back and remind you of what I just explained, and that is that you start out with less margin on day one in your cars on average than you did in years past. You do. You start out with less spread between what you own them for and what they're likely to be sold for on day one than you did in years past, and I predict confidently that you will start out with less next year. Now, every single one of you in this room came in here today believing that if you do some things right, maybe catch a few breaks, you have every right to expect to make more money this year than you did last year, and I'm confident you believe if you do the same next year, you can make more money next year than this year. Not a single person came in here today believing, oh, you know, we start out with less, you know, why should I expect to end up with? No, not one of you. Oh, quite the contrary. Okay, so you guys have a problem here, okay? And here it is. I've got to bring it to your attention. You're starting with less, and you better believe that because it's true. Go home and check it, and you're likely to start with less in the future. So you're starting with less, and every one of you believes if you do your job right, you can end up with more. Huh. <laughs> How's that going to happen? How are you going to start with less and end up with more? Because that's what you're believing, and you do start with less. Do you not think that that is a little bit of an issue, maybe? How are you going to solve for that? What is the only possible way you could possibly start with less and end up with more? Anybody? Sell more? Did I hear that? Sell more? Yeah, you have to sell more. You have to do more volume. But more volume alone cannot get it done. Bad news. Yes, you do have to sell more, but you got to do something more than sell more. Volume alone is not going to overcome this problem. Let me give you an analogy maybe that will help you think about it. Suppose instead of starting with cars and working for profit, suppose we start with oranges and we're working for orange juice. Okay? Here's your reality. Your reality is that you're starting on day one with drier oranges than you used to. Yeah. And it's sitting out there in heat. I know, not so much heat today, maybe, but it's sitting out there in heat. You're starting with drier oranges. And you expect to end up with more orange juice. So what better you do? You better squeeze more oranges for sure, but you have to squeeze them faster. You have to squeeze them faster because they run out of juice sooner. And I'm going to bring you to a very subtle point of understanding that I understand for myself already that many of you will not grasp because you don't want to. But I'm also confident that the point of understanding that I'm going to bring you to is one that over time you will grasp. Because the, the future is going to be one where you are going to do business in an ever-increasing cost environment in an ever-shrinking margin environment. And if you think you're just going to solve this problem by selling more cars, you better think again, because there's some natural limit to how many cars you're going to sell. There just aren't that many people out there to buy cars to bail you out of this condition. There's some limit. So you're going to have to do something more, and that something more you're going to have to do is something that violates every traditional principle of used car management that we know. And that is you're going to have to take some losses. Let me explain this. Let's suppose that you have a vehicle that you sell after 50 days, <clears throat> and that shows a $600 front-end profit. Well, the way that we would look at that today is we'd say, well, that was a pretty lousy profit. You know, it's not what I expected, not what I needed, but better than a poke in the eye. Well, guess what? It's worse than a poke in the eye. And this is hard for us to get our heads around, but let's just stop and think about this for a moment. There's a concept called meaningful marginal contribution. 
And what you have to understand is at some point, some profit, and it might be $600 after 50 days, doesn't return to the organization what it costs to produce it. I mean, certainly we could all understand that if we were squeezing a really dry orange and we really gave it every effort we can for a really long time, and finally it just produced a single drop after we really worked hard, if we consume that drop, we can understand that it would not return to our system that which it took to create. We can get that. Well, that same concept is at work in your used vehicle operations. But you see, it would be very difficult for you to do what I'm actually suggesting that you will need to do. And that is that you will need to come to a recognition that at some point it is better financially for you to take some loss than it is to hang on to it and make some profit. Because if you're willing to take some loss, it gives you the opportunity to redeploy that capital for a better outcome. Today, you cannot, or at least if not today, in the future, you should not count on simply selling enough cars, kicking, them up, uh, kicking up enough dust, and believing that when it all settles, you'll have enough to be happy with. That will be ever more unlikely. You are also not only going to have to be good merchandisers and sellers of used cars, but you guys are going to have to be better money managers. In order to make money, you're going to have to do more with less. And at some point, it is actually better for you to take some loss than it is to produce a non-meaningful marginal contribution. And I know that's very, very difficult to do because it violates every management practice that we know. Man traditional management practices say that used car losses are bad. Used car losses should be avoided. That's how we all grew up. And now, I'm telling you, you better welcome those used car losses. Now, obviously within reason, within reason, but I've got a little number exercise to show you what I'm talking about. So we're a spreadsheet up? Yes. Okay. Let me show you a couple scenarios. Dealership A, traditional dealership A, sells 50 cars used a month and averages two grand a copy, produces $100,000 front end gross. They put those 50 people through the F&I office and they generate, after commission, $700. 35,000, and then those same 50 cars went through the service department, and the gross of, of, of the internal parts and repair, another 500 or 25,000. So in combination, 50 units created $160,000 of gross profit contribution. Okay? Let's do the unthinkable. Let's violate all the rules. Let's take and change that up a little bit. I'm actually going to say, let's sell cars for less. <laughs> how, how many times do we get to say, let's sell cars for less? But I'm saying, let's sell cars for less. But I'm even going to go a step further. I'm going to violate, I'm, I'm going to violate everything. Let's take some losses. Let's intentionally take some losses. Let's be prepared in the interest of liberating our investment capital for the sake of greater productivity. Let's assume, or let's not assume, let's aggressively be prepared to eliminate from our inventory after a certain period of time when they run out of meaningful marginal contribution up to 10% of our retail sales at a $1,000 loss. So let's take less, 2,000 to 1,500, average gross, and let's be prepared to take 10%, not up to, at a $1,000 loss. You'd get fired if you went home with that strategy. But it's the smart strategy. Now, I'm going to make one assumption that if you want to, you can find fault with, but I don't think it's an unreasonable assumption. My one assumption is that if you're willing to do that, you'd sell some more cars. Well, if you're willing to take 10 at a loss of $1,000, I'm sure you'd agree with me, you could sell 10 more cars right there. So I'm assuming you only need to sell another 15 cars. So I'm going to boost your production because you're willing to take less, you're willing to lose money on some from 50 to 75, okay? So we're going to sell 75 cars, 10% of them are going to be losses. So in other words, we're going to sell 67 and a half cars at a $1,500 profit, 
and we're going to generate, I think, $101,250 of gross. We're going to put all 75 through the F&I office, because remember, these are retail. And we're going to generate the same $700, and that brings us back $52,500. If we add that to our 101, 250, we come up to 153, 750, I believe. But we got to account for that loss. Oh yeah, that loss. So we've got um, we've got $150,000, or I'm sorry, we have $15,000 of loss. So we have to deduct that from the 153, 750, and I believe that takes us to 146, 250. Okay. Oh but we still got to put all 75 cars through the shop. Forgot about that. So it's another 37.5. So if we add the 37.5 to the 146.250, we come up with 183.750. Oh, that's a bit more than the 160. How'd that happen? How did that happen? We actually took losses intentionally, and we did the unthinkable. We said, hey, let's sell cars for less front-end gross money. We ended up with more money. How'd that happen? And scenario three says, let's do the same thing. Let's not even jack up the 75. Let's just take losses up to, not up to, add $1,000 on 15% of our cars. And we still end up with, a little less than scenario two, but we still end up with more total gross contribution to our enterprise than we did at scenario A. But you see, not one of you was going to want to go home and try that. But it makes absolute economic sense. You see, the basic problem, as I understand it, are a few. Number one, we grew up in an environment that said losses are bad, losses are to be avoided. So we avoid losses, even when they're good for us. And the second problem that we have is that the way that our financial statement is constructed and the way that our compensation programs are prepared we have this traditional belief that every department needs to stand on its own. <laughs> yeah, every department needs to stand on its own. We're not going to take a sacrifice in one department to benefit another department if our life depended on it. No way. Every department better pull its own weight. It's traditional thinking. It's traditional dealership accounting. But in reality, if we're willing to sacrifice a little bit in our used car operation, recognize that today profitability is so elusive that we have to think about making money in our dealership at an enterprise level, not a department level, then we can quickly understand the logic of the math that says that we'll make more money because we'll put more people through the F&I office, we'll put more cars to the shop, and there's even more benefits downstream that you all recognize. But how difficult, how unintuitive is this approach to making money today. And many of you will not do it today. A few of you I'm beginning to see are willing to take this approach to making money. But I believe firmly that as time goes on, margins continue to compress, your costs continue to go up, it is inevitable that you will come to understand the efficacy of this logic. Because if you don't, I would fear for you. So in conclusion, let me tell you, it's a tough market. Tough challenges. New techniques, new skills, new thinking. But for me, I know that there will be many winners. But in order to be a winner, it's going to require the greatest challenge, the greatest challenge. Greater than fighting the market conditions, fighter than, or tougher than fighting the learning curve of all the new things that we have to know and do to be successful today, you got to appreciate, I believe, the greatest challenge of all is with us. It's up here. It's being willing to question, being willing to break with the past, being willing to look at the current conditions as they are and ask ourselves the tough questions. What in the world are we going to do differently and be prepared to do it? So this is something that we understand very well today at Auto Trader Group. We understand that you are faced with tremendous pressures. 
we understand that your pressures ultimately become our pressures. Our success depends on your success. I can tell you with personal conviction that we get that today. I don't know that we always got that. I'm not sure we always got that. But I can tell you guys that we get that today. So sure, we got plenty of stuff to sell you. But we absolutely understand that the key to your success is less to do with what it is that we have to sell you and more to do with helping you understand and address the challenges that lie ahead. Success ultimately comes through a strategy well executed. So it's a strategy, it's people, it's process, and it's a willingness to learn every single day and try, try, fail, fail again, fail again, keep trying and getting it right. Thank you.